Yo, what's up guys? Alf here, and today I'm going to be doing a full in-depth deck breakdown of a deck that I've recently used to hit rank 1 with on the Arena Ladder. Uh, as you can see from the untapped screenshot, I'm currently 22 and 1 with this deck, so it's been performing really well for me. And now before I get into it, there's going to be an MTGA zone link down in the description. If you click on that, it'll have the full deck list there that you can import into Arena if you want to try the deck out for yourself. Uh, and I'm also in the process of writing a full text article about this deck for MTGA zone premium that'll have more details, a full sideboard guide, how I change the deck for best of one, and some tips and tricks to help you play the deck as well. So as soon as that's finished and up, I'll link that down in the description as well. Well. But anyway, with that all out of the way, this is my Red Black Alter Traveller combo deck in Historic. Now before I get into it, I want to give a quick shout out to Tristan Wild LaRue because this deck is very inspired by his list that he made for the last qualifier, which managed to qualify three or four of his teammates for the next championship, which is super impressive considering how difficult that tournament is. So, the main differences between his deck and mine is there's been a bunch of new additions from the latest Brothers War set, which makes this deck even better, so it's definitely for from my opinion, one of the best decks in the whole format right now. So, the main combo in this deck revolves around Goblin Trap Finder, Ominous Traveller and Ashnod's Altar. So Ominous Traveller, probably the central card in the deck. 2 mana 1-1, one, one. when it enters the battlefield you draft a card from its spellbook. So its spellbook is 15 different creatures. So when this enters the battlefield, you get given 3 of those 15 at random and you get to pick one of them to put into your hand. Then whenever you cast a creature from its spellbook, Ominous Traveller goes back to your hand. So at a base rate, it's basically just a very slow value engine. You play 2 mana, get a card from its spellbook, cast a card from its spellbook, it returns back to your hand. Obviously not that fat powerful, especially in Historic, but if you can reduce the cost of the Ominous Traveller, that's when things start to get broken. So, this is where Goblin Trap Finder comes in. 1 mana 1 1, and when it dies, seek a creature card with mana value 3 or less, card perpetually gains haste, cost 2 less to cast, and sack it at the beginning of the next end step. So, if we get Trap Finder in play and it dies, or we sacrifice it, since the only creatures with mana value 3 or less in the whole deck are Trap Finder and Traveller, we're guaranteed to hit one or the other. If we hit the Traveller, that's perfect, that's what we want to set up. If we hit the Trap Finder, it's not a big deal because then we can just cast that Trap Finder and it will just sack itself at the end step, which then gives us another look at Traveller or Trap Finder. So if we have a Trap Finder, we're almost guaranteed to hit Traveller off it, which is what we're trying to set up. And if we hit Traveller and it costs 0 mana, even without Ashnod's Altar, that's a pretty good value engine because basically every single card off the spellbook is free at that point. And against a lot of decks, just spamming the board every single turn with a zero mana Traveller is going to put you far enough ahead on card advantage that you end up winning. But we can go infinite if we pair it with Ashnod's Altar. So Ashnod's Altar, new card from the latest set, three mana artifact, sack a creature to add two colorless mana. And the important thing about this is we can cast any of the cards off the spellbook no, what, no matter what their mana cost is. You know, it doesn't care about colored mana essentially, which means that every single card off the spellbook that costs one mana is going to net us a mana with the Ashnod's Altar. So say we hit a Falkenrath Pit Fighter, for example, we can cast that, then sacrifice at the Ashnod's Altar to pr produce two mana, and we gain an extra mana every loop we do that. Every creature we get off the spellbook that costs two mana is mana neutral. Every creature that we get off the spell, uh, sorry, every creature that we get off the spellbook that's three mana costs us an extra mana. So the idea with Traveller is you want to set up Altar and a Traveller that costs zero mana and have some mana spare just in case you get unlucky with the first few spellbooks. But once you do get a few spellbook looks, you basically just take every creature that costs one mana because it then nets you mana. And another really important card out of the spellbook when paired with Ashnod's Altar is Headless Rider. So, Headless Rider is a 3 mana 3 1, and whenever it or another non token zombie you control dies, you create a 2 2 black zombie creature token. So, a, basically, a guaranteed way for you to set up not bricking with the Ominous Traveller is to get a Headless Rider and start getting other zombies without having to sacrifice this. Because if you have a Headless Rider in play, there's a bunch of other zombies in the spellbook, and if you then sacrifice one of the zombies with a Headless Rider in play, you get a 2-2 zombie token, which then counts as an extra 2 mana off altar, because you can sacrifice the token to altar to add 2 mana. So Headless Rider essentially makes all of the zombies in the spellbook give you an, an additional 2 mana. So the idea with Traveller is we're trying to set up basically just going mana positive. So you either want to just get a bunch of one drops or set up Headless Rider plus a bunch of other zombies in order to basically just never run out of mana off the altar. And then the way we win from there is, first of all, with this card Dominating Vampire. So Dominating Vampire has 3 mana, 3-3. Three, three. When into the battlefield, gain control of target creature with a mana value less than or equal to the number of vampires you control until the end of turn. Untap it, it gains haste. So... First of all, this enables us to clear the way of the opponent's creatures. If the opponent has a bunch of blockers in play, we can just, you know, keep looping the Traveller until we're mana positive. You know, usually easiest to do once you have a Headless Rider in play. And then once we have enough mana and we don't need to worry about that, we get to ke start keeping vampires around rather than sacrificing them. And then whenever we play a, a Dominating Vampire, we can just steal one of, our, one of our opponent's creatures, and then we can sacrifice our opponent's creatures to, uh, to Ashnod's Altar to produce even more mana. So if you can steal an opponent's creature with Dominating Vampire, it essentially only counts as a one mana creature, but Dominating Vampire basically clears the way of the opponent's board, just keep looping it, steal all your opponent's creatures, 
and then once your opponent has no creatures left, generally the easiest way to win is with Champion of the Perished. So this is a one mana zombie. And whenever another zombie enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one plus one counter on it. Especially if you pair this with Headless Rider, it's very easy to get this up to 20 power. So you basically just use Dominating Vampire, clear all the opponent's stuff out of the way. Then you can use Dominating Vampire on your own Champion of the Perished, because it still gives your own creatures haste when it enters the battlefield. Give your 2020 Champion of the Perished haste, and then just attack for lethal. So that sounds quite complicated, and it kind of is the first few times you're doing it, but hopefully when you see the gameplay, you know, I've got five matches of me playing this deck on the ladder, you'll be able to see how it works. But Essentially, you just want to try and go as mana positive as you can, then get Dominating Vampire to clear the way, and then just attack with Champion of the Parish to finish the game off. So, first of all, the really powerful thing about this combo is that it only takes up 12 slots in the deck, which then enables us to fill the rest of the deck with a very good interactive game plan. Second of all, I think Ashnor's Altar is a really big upgrade over Bergy. So, Tristan's list was running Bergy before the latest um, release of Brothers War. Um, and the only real two advantages of running Bergy over Ashnor's Altar is you do get access to the Horn, which does enable you to kind of grind into the late game sometimes. And you can also find it off the Trap Finder, which can be helpful in certain situations. But the main two reasons why I really prefer Ashnor's Altar over Bergy is, first of all, it doesn't interfere with your Trap Finder hits. Bergy being a three-mana creature does mean that there'll be a lot of situations where you want to hit a Traveller, but you end up hitting a Bergy and it stops you being able to combo off. Just having these as the only two hits means that you're very, very likely to hit the Traveller, which is really huge. And then the second huge advantage of Ashnor's Altar is that not only is it the third combo piece, but it also acts as a sacrifice outlet. So in this deck, I definitely think you need at least eight sacrifice outlets alongside Phyrexian Tower in order to be able to consistently sacrifice Trap Finder. Because if people know how this deck works, they're not going to attack into Trap Finder, they're not going to block it, they're not going to use removal on it. So if you don't have a way to sacrifice the Trap Finder, you can often just end up in a situation where it just sits on the battlefield and you never get the death trigger. So you need to be running a decent number of sacrifice outlets. But the fact that Ashnor's Altar works as the third piece of the combo and a sacrifice outlet means that it saves you know, it frees up more space in the deck for other cards because it counts as one of your eight sacrifice outlets whilst also being a combo piece, basically. So the rest of the deck um, we'll have a look at. Basically, like I said, we get to play a very good interactive plan B. So we kind of play like a Rakdos mid-range deck with a very powerful combo in it as well. So first of all, we've got four copies of Thought C, so just very efficient discard spell. Basically good in most matchups, you know, obviously not that great against the very fast aggressive decks, but it's still fine game one. Then against the slower decks, it's great. Against control, it's great. Against combo decks, it's great as well. And then we have more discard in sideboard for the matchups where it's good. Then because the rest of the format is pretty fast, you know, there's the Thopter decks, there's Wizards, there's Humans, there's Merfolk. You do want to have a decent amount of single target removal. Fatal Push, basically the best or most efficient removal spell in the format. And we're pretty good at triggering the Vault because we have so many sacrifice outlets in Intent, Ashnor's Altar and Phyrexian Tower. So very easy to trigger the revolt. And then because we have a bunch of sacrifice outlets for the trap finder, that also enables us to run claim the firstborn. Um, so we can claim and then sack it for intent to search for a card, sack it to alter to generate mana, sack it to Phyrexian Tower to generate mana as well. So claim the firstborn, just another very efficient removal spell. Um, now I don't like running more than three copies, first of all, because obviously some decks don't run creatures. If you, crew, if you go into a control matchup, you're only ever going to be able to steal like Wandering Emperor tokens with this. And additionally, I think since sw swapping over to Ashnor's Altar, claim the firstborn isn't as good as it was in Tristan's deck because we're no longer running village rights so you know you need to wait until you have three mana to use it with diabolic intent you need to wait until you have four mana for Ashnor's Altar so it can be a little bit slow but in the matchups where it's good against creature decks it's very strong and we do have the fourth in the sideboard as well then we've got four copies of diabolic intent so this is another new addition from the Brothers War two mana sack a creature is the cost search your library for a card and put it into your hand so this is really huge because it obviously allows us to find whatever combo piece we're missing going trap finder on one into intent on two is so strong because it allows us to just find the Ashnor's Altar and hopefully hit a traveler in the same term which is huge you know if we already have a sacrifice out there we can find trap finder if we don't we can just find the altar and then you know the really th strong thing about having altar in play is anytime we top like a trap finder that's often just going to be good enough to win the game immediately because another really strong thing about cutting bergy from the deck is trap finder will all will always hit the traveler if you go through them so if you have altar in play and some amount of red mana you can go trap finder suck it to make a mana uh, sack it to make two mana so you're one mana up and even if you find another trap finder you can just cast the trap finder sack it again and it actually produces more mana from doing that as well so trap finder and altar work super well together to consistently set up the combo and intent finding the combo pieces is really huge it also enables us to find one of like we've got emergency weld that i'll get to in a second that's important in some situations and we have some one ofs in the sideboard that are very important to be able to find post sideboard so diabolic intent very key card 
And we've got one of Emergency Weld. So like I said, this is mainly here as a Diabolic Intent Shooter target. It allows us to rebuy any of our combo pieces, whether that's Trap Finder, Traveller, or Ashnod's Altar. Particularly important if the opponent's killed a Zero Mana trap, uh, Traveller. If they've killed a Zero Mana Traveller with a Discard Spell or something like a Fatal Push, you can then use Diabolic Intent to tutor up Emergency Weld, get back the Traveller, and if you have an Ashnod's Altar in play, the Emergency Weld actually pays for itself because it also creates a token which you can then sacrifice for two mana as well. So this is great because it picks up all of our combo pieces from the graveyard and produces a token which provides more sacrifice fodder for something like Diabolic Intent or Ashnod's Altar as well. Then we've got Fable of the Mirror Breaker, so one heuristic that's always held true for me when building combo decks is if your deck has a lot of redundancy for the combo, you can kind of build your whole deck around it, whereas if your deck doesn't have a lot of redundancy for your combo pieces, like this deck, because we need these very specific combo pieces, then it's generally best to run a plan B alongside it because otherwise you end up having really disparate hands where you'll have some hands where you just have the combo and you go off on turn three and you'll have other hands where you have like one combo piece and then the rest of your hand is just digging for that and the difference in speed between those two hands is really huge uh, same sort of thing means that you often have to mulligan quite a lot as well because you generally prioritize the hands that have more combo pieces in and that alone makes you more vulnerable to specifically to discard spells and counter spells additionally it makes your deck much more one-dimensional if you don't have a plan b in the deck the opponent can often sideboard in hate cards against you which you struggle to beat as well so in general in a deck like this where you don't have a ton of redundancy i think you really do want to be running a plan b alongside it and favor of the mirror breaker is great because it acts as a somewhat of a plan b that also helps to dig for your combo pieces so chapter one creates the 2-2 token and creates treasure is just great at getting us ahead on mana. Chapter 2, super important. The looting ability helps us dig towards our combo pieces, which is really huge. And then Reflection of Kiki Jiki just acts as a good late game engine. We can copy the 2 2 to start generating more mana. We can copy Trap Finders to get more death triggers. We can also copy Frexion Flesh Gorge that I'll get to in a second. So Fable, really good at allowing us to win without needing to combo, whilst also helping us to find the combo. And then Frexion Flesh Gorger, this is another card that is here for multiple reasons. So, first of all, like I said, you really want to be having a plan B in the deck. And this just allows enables us to win even if the opponent has like a rest in peace or a curse of shaken faith in play you can often just beat the opponent down with the Phyrexian Flesh Gorger which is really huge uh, additionally you know one of the big weaknesses of running Trap Finder is it doesn't enable you to run creatures between mana value 1 or 3 without interfering with your Trap Finder hits. And Phyrexian Flesh Gorger is really nice because it's a creature that you can play on turn 3 and it is a decent rate on turn 3 as well but it's technically 7 mana so it doesn't interfere with your Trap Finder hits as well we can also cast this for 7 mana as well because we have access to Ashnod's Altar. So if we have some tokens lying around, we can just sacrifice them, pay 7 mana, and a 7 mana 7-5 seven Menace Lifelink Ward is really hard for a lot of decks to beat. The second main reason why this is in the deck is because I felt like the only decks that I was ever really close to losing to was aggro. I feel like you, you're you very, very capable of grinding the mid-range and the control decks out fairly easily. So the only decks I was really struggling against were stuff like humans if they go you know, Sentinel Thalia and just start swarming the board and your single target removal isn't good enough or wizards if you only have one or two pieces of interaction and the opponent has a very creature heavy hand they can sometimes race you there because you do need to spin your wheels in order to set up the combo and phyrexian flesh gorger is just a threat that slows those aggro decks down so much is also pretty good against control as well because of the ward cost dealing them damage so i really like this as a card that i can slam on turn three as just a way to help stabilize against the aggro decks. It's like I said, it's also a card that we can just use to beat the opponent down and have more of a fair game plan as well. So I really like Flesh Gorger that works as a plan B and also helps to shore up the aggro matchups, which I do feel will be the worst matchups going forward, especially if the red decks, you know, if like a deck like Mono Red, Gruel Aggro, or Is It Phoenix starts to run Curse of Shaken Faith in the sideboard, I think this will be a more important card in that sort of metagame as well. Then we also get to run Gigantha as the companion, which is really huge as well. I did debate running some double colored cards in the main deck like Brotherhood's End as a tutor target for Diabolic Intent, but the more I played with the deck, the more I realized you're almost always better using Diabolic Intent just to find your combo rather than to find answers. And I also felt like Gigantha was such an important part of the deck because it just gives you something to do with the excess mana you get off Ashnod's Altar. You know, if you sacrifice a creature for whatever reason, just being able to put Gigantha into your hand is really huge. And like I said as well, you know, having a good plan B alongside your main combo is super important at being able to beat your opponents that are relying on their sideboard cards to beat you, your combo specifically specifically, 
or against opponents that, you know, they're just sitting on fatal pushes to stop you comboing off. Being able to just go Gigantha into hand, play Gigantha. Now you have to deal with my 5-5 five five and me potentially drawing the combo at the same time. So Gigantha, really important part of the deck. The mana base, um, one of the changes I've made from Tristan's list to mine is going up to 24 lands because they were running Village Rights and Deadly Dispute as their sacrifice outlets which draw cards. Obviously, we're not doing that anymore, so I think you need to up the land count to at least 24, So, because you need to hit your third land drop on curve for Astronaut's Altar and Fable of the Mirror Breaker, so 24 has felt like a good amount. Uh, in terms of the actual lands themselves, I like Hive and Den specifically because they kind of help with the plan B of the deck to enable you to win, even if you can't combo off, which is huge. Uh, Takanuma is a two of I really like because... It enables you to rebuy Traveller. You know, if, you, if you've if you hit a zero mana Traveller and the opponent's killed it to the graveyard, you can use Takanuma to rebuy it, which is really huge. Sokken Zan is one of is also pretty free, but the tokens can also be nice sacrifice fodder for the Astronaut's Altar to enable, you know, just produce more mana to reduce your chances of bricking when you go off in your Traveller turn, which is really nice. Uh, then a bunch of dual lands. The main difference I've made to the mana base from Tristan's build is I've gone up to three Phyrexian Tower. I wanted to go from 23 to 24 lands, and I was so, so impressed with Tower. Now, obviously, there are diminishing returns on drawing multiples of this for sure but I just felt like the games where I had it was so much more powerful than the games I didn't so I really wanted to maximize my chances of drawing the first copy I, ne I don't think you can ever really go up to four because you will just end up with clunky hands where you draw multiples but I really like three because the first copy of this is so so important in a number of ways especially important as well now because we're not running village rights you know claim the firstborn without Phyrexian Tower is actually a pretty slow removal spell because the earliest you can use this and sacrifice your opponent's creature is turn three in conjunction with diabolic intent whereas in Tristan's build you could do it on turn two with village rights so I like going up to Frexian Tower just to improve the quality of Claim the Firstborn a bit more as well. So that's the main deck. I've been really, really impressed with it. I think, you know, the only deck, that, like I said, that I've really struggled with is Aggro. And Frexian Flesh Gorger really helps to shore up that matchup. So that's why I really like it in the flex slot. And outside of that, I just think the deck's super powerful in general. Then onto the sideboard, uh, I've got one of Tormod's Crypt as essentially a tutor target off di Diabolic Intent for matchups where Graveyard Hate is relevant. I like, I much prefer, like, we do have Unlicensed Hearse as well. It's just you know, give us a bit more high density of graveyard hate to maximize our chances of drawing it in the matchups where it is important, like Kethis combo or, f or uh, is it Phoenix? But I like a Tormod's Crypt over a second unlicensed hearse or something like Soul Guide Lantern because I have had a few instances where I needed the graveyard hate the turn that I played the Diabolic Intent. So if you only have two mana available, you can just Diabolic Intent, get Tormod's Crypt and play it immediately, which is really huge. Uh, three copies of Duress basically for the control and, you know, non-creature combo in general as well. Uh, we do have quite a few removal spells in the main deck. You know, we've got four push, three claim the firstborn. So I did want a decent high density of cards to swap those out for in the control matchup. And Duress is like the perfect card for that matchup, really. Uh, one copy of Pithing Needle is more of a recent addition, but I felt this is important for Goblin Charbelcher decks for a start because they are typically run Leyline of Sanctity in the sideboard and your main game plan in that matchup is discard spells. So if the opponent can set up a Leyline of Sanctity, you don't really have a good way to stop that, whereas just running a one-off Pithing Needle that you can search off Diabolic Intent just basically allows you to shut off the Golden Char Belcher, whilst ov obviously also having good utility in other matchups as well. I'll also bring this in against Control to shut off stuff like Teferi Hero of Dominaria as well, so Pithing Needle, really nice as a one-off cheat target there as well. And uh, then we've got the fourth copy of Claim the First Bomb for the creature matchups, well that's good. Feed the Swarm is a very important card to have access to in the sideboard because it allows you to kill, first of all, Curse of Shaken Faith, which is basically impossible to beat if you're relying on combo off and also shuts off rest in peace if the opponent gets a rest in peace in play before you can sacrifice the trap finder there's no way that you can reduce the traveler so feed the swarm very important in matchups where they could either bring in rest in peace or claim oh sorry curse of shaken faith against you speaking of curse of shaken faith this is a card that i'm basically just teching for the mirror match i definitely expect this deck to start becoming more popular soon and being able to cheat to this in the mirror match if the opponent doesn't have a feed the swarm basically just shuts them off from comboing completely which is really huge you know in the mirror matches in, in Alchemy when we were playing the Trap Finder decks in the past, Curse of Shaken Faith was the card that would just win you the mirror match. So this is basically exclusively for the mirror, and if the opponent doesn't have a, curse, uh, a Feed the Swarm to kill it, you basically just stop them comboing off, which is huge. Then three copies of Brotherhood's End, another card from Brothers War. So it either acts as a sweep of creatures or as a way to hose the artifact decks. And I really like this as a three of in the deck because it's great against the artifact decks, for example, the Thopters or the Affinity deck. They're still very popular, and this is basically a complete blowout against them if you can resolve Resolve it, but it's also really efficient against the other aggro decks. You know, like I said, aggro is probably the hardest matchup for you. You do have good tools, but 
that's the matchup I'm the most scared of. I feel like I can grind pretty well against most other decks. So having Brotherhood's End as a way to sweep the board against elves or wizards or, you know, merfolk or humans or anything like that just really helps to ensure you don't get run down in those matchups. And then finally, we've got two copies of Kologan's Command. So this is here for a number of matchups. I like this against other mid-range decks like Rakdos Midrange is just a way to two for one. Potent another way to rebuy the Traveler because they're more likely to be bringing more discard spells against you. I also like it against Control as well because, again, it enables you to rebuy the Traveler if the opponent's holding to removal for it, forces them to discard, um, and it's also good against the artifact decks as well because of the ability to destroy an artifact. So that's the deck. Like I said, it's one of my picks for the best deck in the format right now because the combo can go off so quickly. It's such a lean part of the deck that you can then make the rest of the deck have a powerful interactive game plan as well. So you, you essentially play a slightly worse Rakdos mid-range deck, which is already one of the best decks in the format, whilst also having a really powerful combo, which is so hard to stop. Uh, so anyway, that's the deck. If you've got any questions at all, drop me a comment below. Next up, I've got some gameplay. I've got five matches that I was playing with this on the ladder so you guys can see it in action. So I hope you enjoy. Big up. Okay, sweet. Here we go. Okay, so we're on the play here. And ha, huh, I mean, this hand is really sick if we can find a red source. If we can find a red source, we've got two removal spells, we've got one of the combo pieces, and a way to chew to the second as well. So I think I'm going to risk this. You know, if we don't draw a red source in the first few turns, it could be a bit of a sketchy one. But we also do have Thoughtseize to s slow down the opponent's early starts as well. Okay, so we're against Esper Greasefang. Evangelist Synthesis is a pretty new, nice new addition to this deck, actually. I've not considered that one. I mean, either way, I think we're definitely taking the Grease Fang because their combo is the only thing we're really scared of. Their fair beatdown game plan should hopefully give us a lot of time to find the combo and be able to go off. Whereas if they can set up Grease Fang on turn three, that's going to be hard for us to race. So, okay, so they play the Evangel. Hopefully they haven't drawn a Parhelion. If they've got Parhelion into Grease Fang on three, okay, they don't, thankfully. Yikes. So we didn't draw our third land, or, you know, we've got the Tau, but we don't want to play that yet. I think we're just going to get rid of the other Grease Fang just in case they top deck a Parhelion or something, and then we'll just pass it back. So yeah, not drawing a red source there kind of sucks, but it is what it is. Okay, so they play another Evangel here. Thankfully, we've got rid of two Grease Fangs, so, you know, unless they happen to draw another one and a Parhelion, we shouldn't have to worry about getting comboed off. Now we just have to worry about beating their fair, you know, their fair beatdown game plan, essentially. Yikes, no red. I mean, maybe, to be honest, maybe I should have just played the Ashnod's Altar there. Maybe because I can tap the Frexian Tower for Colorless, play the second one, and then pay three for the Altar. I probably should have done that thinking about it. Wow, okay. So, not drawing super well here. I mean, obviously, this is the risk of running three Frexian Towers, but I think this is the only time that this has ever come up this bad. And. I think we're fairly likely to draw a red source off the top. And if we do, I think we're in a pretty decent spot, to be honest. Oh, wow. Okay, so they just, they just get to tack on back, the Grease Fang. They already have Pyavian in the graveyard. So that was kind of on me for keeping a risky hand. But I feel like if we'd drawn a red source, we probably would have been a, a favorite in that game. Either way, we want to have some graveyard hate here, so we're bringing the Tormod's Crypt. I also think I like Pithing Needle here because we can name Parhelion, which will stop their combo. I think the combo is the only thing we're really scared of here, to be honest. Um, and then what other cards do we want here? I, I think I like Brotherhood's End because we only saw, you know, a few cards in the deck. But if they're running a similar build to what I posted a few months ago, they're likely to have Thalia, they're likely to have Esper Sentinel, and Brotherhood's then just being able to sweep the whole board when they don't have the combo seems important to stabilizing. I think... <clears throat> I'm not 100% sure how good Claim the Firstborn is going to be. Um, just because... I mean, it can be useful to kill stuff like Thalia or Esper Sentinel, but it's sorcery speed, which is definitely a big issue against Grease Fang and Rafine as well. Uh, and I think, you know... Since we're bringing Brotherhood's End, we don't want too much interaction because you can end up with hands with, you know, no proactive stuff going on. So I like running back like this and see see how it runs. Okay, this is sick. This is almost perfect. Maybe, uh, you know, if we could swap one of these lands for another card, it'd be ideal. But we get to go Trap Finder into Tormod's Crypt. So now their combo is shut off and we have, you know, Trap Finder plus Alter is usually good enough to go off unless the opponent has a way to stop it. Okay, second trap find is great here. Even if they have a way to exile the first, we can still just go alter next turn. And the only thing I'm really worried about here is Skyclave Apparition. If they can Apparition the altar before we can go off, then that will be an issue. Now we could potentially just go alter and go off next turn because we do get four mana off sacrificing the two trap finders, but 
you can brick off four mana. You know, I've definitely bricked before. All you need to do is get two bad uh, spell books off your first couple. Okay, Thalia, I mean, so that, that shuts us off doing it straight away anyway. Wow, another trap finder. Okay. So, I mean, we should be able to go off next turn now because I'm happy, you know, six mana is almost guaranteed to be able to go off properly. Especially if they, if they tap out here, that would be perfect. Okay, six. So we should just win next turn unless we get, you know, incredibly unlucky. If we get like three or four spell books in a row where we don't get anything less than a three drop, then we might end up losing here, but... Okay, they don't attack either. I mean, we wouldn't have blocked either way. So I'm just going to play the Ashnaz Altar out here, sacrifice all the three Trap Finders, and we're guaranteed to hit a Traveller off one of these anyway. Um, but yeah, so now we have a backup Traveller as well, which is sick. And we have six mana, which, like I said, should be more than enough to go off here. So we play the Traveller, and we're looking for cheap stuff initially. Dominating Vampire can be good if you can steal an opponent's creature because then it counts as, you know, a one-mana creature to, to get, essentially, because you get two mana back off sacking the opponent's creature. Okay, again, we can't steal an opponent's creature yet, but getting Vampire Socialite means that if we do now hit a Dominating Vampire, we can steal the Thalia, which would give us two mana back. Okay, Headless Rider 6. So Headless Rider is one of the most important cards to get because if you can get Headless Rider and start getting other zombies off, then that basically is guaranteed for you to not be able to brick because of the excess mana you get. Okay, sweet. So we got a two-mana zombie. We could have gone for another Headless Rider again there. Maybe that was probably better, but I have to do this quite quickly because there is there is a hard five-minute time limit on your turn. Uh, okay, we're going for Tovalar here. Probably should have gone for the Dominating Vampire thing about it, but you do need to play quite quickly on this because you you will run out of time if you get unlucky spell books. So you do need to play pretty quickly. Um, okay, we'll go for Dominating Vampire now. Um, using the space bar is also super important when you're comboing off because you don't have to keep moving your mouse to the bottom right, which also saves a lot of time. So unfortunately, we can't steal another creature here yet, but if we get another Dominating Vampire, we can steal Thalia. Okay, Champion of the Perished is nice here, because that's a creature that we can sacrifice to produce a 2-2 two -two off Headless Rider, which then generates us even more mana. So this Champion of the Perished... Oh, okay, sick. Another Headless Rider is great. Uh, might as well play this other Traveler here, just to give us a bit more mana. Um, because... Now we get to keep the Champion of the Perished around as well, which is pretty huge, because the way you normally win, once you have everything set up, is by giving Champion of the Perished haste with Dominating Vampire. And so starting to build up one Champion of the Perished here will hopefully save us time later. Okay, we'll get another zombie here. Now we do have to clear the way uh, for our creatures to attack. So we do need to get Dominating Vampires eventually, but I, I think we have enough time here where I just want to make sure that we we don't brick. I mean, we've got two Headless Riders, so we're basically guaranteed to not brick anyway, but... So yeah, from now on, we're basically just looking for Vampires and Dominating Vampire, because as long as we get some other zombies along the way, the Headless Riders should basically mean that we don't ever um, brick because of all the extra tokens we get off the Headless Rider. But yeah, we're basically just looking for vampires and dominating vampire now. And the nice thing about having two champion of the perished here is that if we, you know, sometimes you have to steal the opponent's creatures to win, but oftentimes you can just give your own champion of the perished haste, boost them up so they have power equal to the opponent's life total, and then force them to chump block. You know, you don't always have to steal the opponent's creatures. And the other nice thing here about having multiple travelers is even if we did get close to breaking, we could always just cast the second traveler as an extra way to produce more mana. Okay, another champion of the perished. So again, we are looking just for vampires or dominating vampire here because we definitely have, you know, we're definitely going to have a lethal champion of the perished by the time we're finished. So we'll sacrifice a zombie token here, get another champion of the perished into play boost all these and I think now we're probably at the point where we would prefer to use Dominating Vampire on our own Champion of the Perished rather than stealing the opponent's creatures okay another Champion of the Perished so I'm going to sacrifice one of these just to save us time on triggers here because I think the only way we're not winning this is if we end up timing out. I mean, even if we do time out, the best the opponent could do is somehow pitch Parhelion, cast Greasefang, and that only does 13 damage. 
Not even to mention that you can get flies off the spell book as well. So even if we do time out here, I think we're basically guaranteed to win. But okay, sweet. So we've got Dominating Vampire. So we can either steal Thalia or just give our 2020 haste here. Um, might as well just give the 2020 haste because they're forced to chump block. Okay, sick. Another domin Dominating Vampire is great. And, you, you know, you can just get a bunch of spellbooks where you don't hit Dominating Vampires or you don't hit Champion of the Parish, which is why... Oh, sick. We got pretty lucky there. But, yeah, this is the reason why you need to be playing fast because if you do get to this point and you just weren't hitting Dominating Vampires, you could just hit the five-minute turn limit. Either way, we managed to get there. So just get to attack him for 20 with a, a huge Champion of the Parish. And, yeah, that was a much, much better game, obviously. Oh, I guess we also had Tormo's Crypt to stop them comboing off anyway. So we obviously can't run Gigantria as our companion because we've got the Brotherhood's End in the deck. But I feel like Brotherhood's End, in the matchups where it's good, it's definitely worth foregoing the Gigantha. You know, in this sort of matchup, uh, if they're relying on their fair beat up, just, you know, attack game plan rather than the Grease Fang combo, then Brotherhood's End is sick. And the way the deck is built, if it's, you know, similar to the deck I posted a few months ago, it's actually not too easy for them to set up the Grease Fang combo in the early game. They kind of rely on their fair beat down game plan in a lot of the matchups so brotherhood's end is really really effective against that especially considering diviner of fates is now a 2-1 uh so it's much you know you're, you're basically guaranteed to be able to kill it with the brotherhood's end which is really nice so we're obviously going second here which is a bit concerning because i assume they are running esper sentinel thalia which is pretty good against a lot of our stuff but again this is a great hand i think you know we've got trap finder and altar which you know, if they don't have a way to kill the altar or to exile, the trap finder is usually good enough to win. Okay, unfortunately, they do have the sentinel on one, which means that we can't go for thought seize. Or, you know, we could go for thought seize, but it kind of defeats the whole point if we give them an extra card. Wow, sentinel into Thalia. Okay, that is like the start we didn't want to see. That is pretty rough. So I think we're just going to pass here. You know, we can Fatal Push to Thalia, but it gives them a card off the Sentinel, which isn't ideal, obviously. Okay, into Diviner. I mean, there's a chance they don't attack here. They probably don't want to give us the Trap Finder trigger. Wow, and they have the Parhelion as well. Okay, that's scary. So I kind of feel like I need to push the Thalia here because I want to Thought Seize next turn. You know, we could go for Alter, but... I feel like I want to just stop them from having Grease Fang, especially because, you know, we gave them an extra draw. Now, if they have two Grease Fangs here, we're kind of just screwed. We could potentially just go for Alter and try and combo off here, but that's not... Actually, no, that's not going to work. You need at least one mana to be able to do that. So I think we're just going to go for Thought Seize this turn just to try and get rid of Grease Fang if they have it. Now, they do get to Seek off the Diviner. Okay, phew, they only had one Grease Fang. Oh, they have Inquisitor Captain, though, which is pretty scary. So... I think my game plan here is just hope that they don't draw Grease Fang, hope that they don't hit Grease Fang off the Inquisitor Captain, and then we're probably just forced to go off next turn. I mean, I'm hoping they don't hit Athalia here. Okay, Rafine. Okay, so that should be alright, I think. Now, we are going to have to get a little bit lucky off the Spellbook hits, I think, but we've got a reasonable chance here, I think. Because, you know, we'll give them a card draw off the Sentinel Trigger... With when we play the altar, but we do get two mana immediately back from sacking the trap finder. And if we hit, you know, we, we want to make sure that we have access to the red mana off the pathway here in case trap finder hits another trap finder. So we kind of, I would actually prefer to hit a trap finder here just because it gives us an extra mana, but travel is fine. You know, the nightmare scenario there is just hitting three trap finders in a row. Okay, pit fight is great. So now we're a mana ahead already. So, as long as we don't get really bad spell books, I think we should be fine. Okay, sweet. Another Champion of the Perished. So, that was, well, sorry, another one drop. So, now we're, we're up two mana, which is really big. Okay, sick. Another one drop, but we might as well go for the Dominating Vampire here, because that, that essentially counts as a one drop. I'm going to keep the Champion of the Perished around instead of the Pit Fighter in case we hit Headless Rider. If we hit Headless Rider, it's very beneficial to already have zombies in play so that we can then immediately sacrifice them and get 2-2 two -two tokens, which is great. Oh, wow. Okay, that was a bad spellbook for sure. So here, I'm just going to sacrifice the Sentinel and the Dominating Vampire. Again, I'm going to keep the Champion of the Perished around because if we hit Headless Rider, then we can just sacrifice the Champion of the Perished to get a, a zombie token, which puts us up 2 mana straight away. Okay, another 1 mana creature is huge. 
So now we're up on Manor again. Go for Traveller again here. Yikes. Okay, that was a bad spell book. So we sacrifice the Pit Fighter and I'm going to sacrifice the Arch Ghoul over the Champion just because it's less triggers. You know, we, if we keep the Arch Ghoul around, we're going to have to surveil every time one of our zombies dies. And Champion of the Perished is kind of one that we want to have stick around anyway. So again, I'm going to keep make, make sure that I keep the zombie in play for in case we hit Headless Rider for us to be able to go plus there. So I'll pitch the Ominous Traveler that isn't discounted. Okay, another Champion of the Perished is nice. So now if we hit Headless Rider, you know, I think we're probably good. Okay, another Champion of the Perished. Could have potentially gone for Dominating Vampire if we had more Vampires in play, but Dominating Vampire doesn't give anything haste and it can't steal anything at the moment, so we just go for the cheaper card. Oh, well, they just scoop it up. Okay, props to the opponent. We would have got there, I think, but we'll take it. Okay, so we're going second here. And yeah, I think this looks good. You know, we've got Trap Finder, we've got Early Interaction, both in the hand and on the battlefield. We've got Flesh Gorder as well, so as long as we can find a suck outlet for Trap Finder, I think we should be good here. Okay, Fanatical Firebrand, sure. So I was debating between Thoughtseize and Trap Finder, but drawing this Diabolic Intent makes me pretty incentivized to play the Trap Finder here. Not only would it kind of stop the opponent from attacking, probably, but it also enables us to go Diabolic Intent next turn to find the uh, Ashnod's Altar. Okay, so we're against Mono Red Aggro by the looks of things. Nothing to play off the Trap Find uh, off the Emissary is really good to see. And they don't attack either, which is great. So the downside of playing the Diabolic Intent here is that they will just get to freely start attacking, but... If we do go for Intent, we cast the Ashnod's Altar next turn, and then we can probably go off the turn after that. So that would mean the opponent would need to deal 19 damage within two turns, and I think they would probably need Ember Cleave to do that. So I think we're just going to go racing mode here. Even though we're on the draw, I think we can still race them. You know, 19 damage by you know within two turns is going to be difficult for them to set up. And they don't even attack with the Firebrand here, so... Okay, they got annexed, so that is pretty scary because we could fatal push the annex here and take them off winning with Ember Cleave, but then that stops us from winning a turn earlier. I think I like. <sighs> Thing is, if we go for the altar, we lose to Ember Cleave, but I think it's better to force the opponent to have it and almost guarantee that we win next turn if they don't. You know, again, we could have gone Trap Finder, sack it to tower, kill the annex with fatal push, but. Wow, they attack with everything. Do they have Ember Cleave? Oh, wow. Okay, they did. So, I mean, even though we did end up losing there, I still think I prefer the line of just play the Anvil out. Uh, sorry, not the Anvil. The, the Ashnod's Altar out there. Force them to have Ember Cleave because even if they don't, you know, we kill the... Yeah, even if they have Ember Cleave, what? We take a turn off to kill the Anax. Um, sorry, I'm just thinking about sideboarding here. Yeah, so I'm basically just cutting Thought Seas, bringing Claim and Brotherhood's End. So I just cut the Thought Seas for more removal. But yeah, that last game, even if I took the turn off to kill the Anax, they get two tokens off the Anax dying, and then they still have Ember Cleave for the following turn. And that puts us a turn behind on comboing as well. So I still don't think we would have won, even if I'd killed the Anax there. So I think just trying to race was probably the right line there. This hand is sick. You know, obviously having two Shock Lands isn't ideal against an aggro deck, but... Two Flesh Gorges is going to be a real stumbling block for them. Diabolic Intent with Trap Finder is a great start. And we also have Fatal Push as well. So, Okay, Kumano faces Kakazan. So we should probably use the Intent before that flips. Otherwise, they can potentially exile the Trap Finder. And to be honest, we don't really have a better play. We could just pass with Fatal Push up here. But I think we're better off just using the Intent, finding the Altar here, and just hoping to draw land. Okay. Wow. Okay, the opponent passes and we did draw land, which is perfect. So I guess the opponent must just have a bunch of burn spells. I guess that makes sense because they want to be able to kill the Traveler before we get to pop off with it, really. Okay, so opponent passes back again. I mean, 
we do have another diabolic intent to be able to search maybe to get the um hold on a sec yeah maybe to get the card that gets trap uh, traveler back from the graveyard oh wow okay so we hit another trap finder so we can suck again here And then, if they do have a burn spell for the Traveler, we can then hard cast Flesh Gorger for 7 mana. Now, they should wait for us to pick the Spellbook card here. And they really should wait for us to cast the Spellbook card as well. Okay. So, I imagine they have to have a burn spell here if they've been this slow to commit to the board. Okay, I mean, it is Bone Crusher Giant, which is good to see because we do get to fizzle the, the creature part of it. And then, I mean, I think we should just take the opportunity to get Flesh Gorger in play here. They're really not going to be able to beat a 7-5 with lifelink. And we also get to hold up Fatal Push now as well. So even though we did lose the Traveler, we still managed to just put the mana together to put a Flesh Gorger in play, which is surely going to win the game. I very much doubt they're going to be able to beat a 7-5 lifelink. Okay, do we want a Fatal Push here? I kind of want to save Fatal Push for an Annex. I feel like that's the only way we're really losing here. And I, if, you know, they might triple block here, in which case we can just blow them out in combat with the Fatal Push. Okay, so no blocks is interesting. I think I'm just going to run out the Fable here. And then, you know, the only real way they're going to win here is with Ember Cleave. But even then, you know, racing seven damage, or se you know, a seven power lifelinker every turn is going to be really hard for them. Okay, so I guess they just have to attack in here. They might have a McCleave, but I still think we can race it. So I'm just going to block the Robber of the Rich, see if they've got Ember Cleave. No, okay. I mean, I guess they were just hoping to hit something good off the Robber of the Riches there then. But yeah, overall that felt pretty good. You know, Flesh Gorger putting in work there. And I do think from playing this deck, it is, you know, you're favored, you feel favored against everything, but the matchups where I felt close to losing or ended up did losing, was against very fast starts from the aggro decks. And I feel like Flesh Gorger goes such a long way to mitigate that. Okay, no play on turn one is huge for us. I'm just going to run out of Trap Finder here. Okay, opponent plays a Burning Tree. Wow, and Lava Coil. Okay, so that's a bit rough because... We don't have a good target for the emergency world anymore, which kind of sucks. And we don't have a way to use claim the firstborn until turn four at the earliest now, which is a bit sketchy. So I think since we don't have a way to trigger revolt at the moment, we do want to slow their aggro start down. I'm just going to push the burning tree emissary here. Okay, they did have the they do have the anax, which is a bit annoying, but we don't have a way to kill the anax with fatal push anyway. And to be honest, stealing anax is pretty sick. If you know. We, we can steal it and then sack it, and we get the tokens when it dies, which is pretty nice. Okay, so Robert the Rich didn't hit anything, which is pretty huge. We will claim the first one, the Anax here, and then I'll just attack with it. And then we'll sack it here, and it will get a token, and... Wait, so I was just going to cast the front side of Frexian Flesh Gorger, but we can actually cast the 7 mana one again because we can sacrifice the 1-1 one, one here. We can shock in the Blood Crypt and then just hard cast the, the 7 mana Flesh Gorger here, which is sick. So again, you know, they basically need another Lava Coil to win here. And even then, you know, paying 7 life for Ward is pretty ridiculous. So if they attack, I have to imagine they do have a lava coil here, but we're still we what we would go up to eighteen and they'd take seven, so Although, hmm Okay, opponent just scoops up. Yeah, Flesh Gorger put in work there. And we're rank one, sick. Okay, so we're going second here. And yeah, I think this hand's good. You know, we don't currently have a way to say to sack the trap finder, but the rest of the hand looks decent to me. Okay, opponent leads on an Inquisition here. So, from our point of view, you know, I think trap finder is probably the card we don't want them to take because, you know, both Fable and Flesh Gorge are both work as 
you know, fair stuff that we can do if we hit our third land drop on curve. And I don't know, it, it depends what deck they're on, depends what their hand's like. I guess what they take could tell us something about their hand as well. Okay, so they take Fable, that kind of makes sense. Uh, I guess we'll just get to look at their hand now anyway, so we'll thought seize them, see what they're on. Huh, okay, so it looks like they're just on Rakdos mid-range. I mean, Misery Shadow is definitely an issue because it stops the Trap Finder death triggering. We do have Fatal Push to kill it, but I feel like that's the only really threatening card in their hand at the moment. You know, it would be kind of a nightmare if we took Fatal Push, say. I, yeah, I mean, Fatal Push is an issue long-term because it stops us comboing off, but we have Flesh Gorger in hand that can bait it out anyway. And, you know, it would have been kind of a nightmare scenario if we don't take the Shadow and then they have another discard spell to take our Fatal Push. So here, we definitely want the third land. I'm not going to get greedy and discard a land here. So I think it's between Fatal Push and Flesh Gorger. Trap Finder is a really important card. I think... Hmm. This is tough because if they draw another Misery Shadow, that shuts off the Trap Finder. So I kind of want to hold on to Fatal Push... And there's also an, a, like a number of threats that we want to be able to kill with the Fatal Push anyway, you know, stuff like Blood Tithe Harvester or the 2-2 two -two token off uh, Fable of the Mirror Breaker are cards that we want to be able to kill. So even though we do lose the Flesh Gorger, I think Fatal Push is more important in this spot. And we can always just put Giganther into our hand if the opponent doesn't really do much here. Wow, okay, so they missed their third land drop, which obviously sucks for them. Ooh, okay, Diabolic Intent was a sick draw. So, you know, the risk of attacking here is they could Fatal Push it, but... I'd be pretty happy with that exchange anyway. So we'll just Diabolic Intent here and we'll just search up the uh, the Ashnod's Altar. Okay, and we hit Traveller as well, which is nice. So assuming they don't have Discard Spells, we should be go off we should be good to go off in two turns. Uh, I guess they've got the Fatal Push to kill the Traveller, which is a bit of an issue, but not the end of the world. Ha, okay. So I think I'm just going to play the Ashnod's Altar here. And then if they ever tap out, you know, if they draw land and play Fable, we just win. Okay, so they pass. I mean, since we know they have Fatal Push, I think it's too risky to go for the Traveler right now. I think I'm just going to go for the Flesh Gorger here, and then... You know, they can't kill that with the Fatal Push. They're probably just going to use the Strangle to kill it, but that will mean if they do draw the land for the turn, they can't play a 3-drop, which is pretty important. But yeah, either way, we would love to be able to bait out Fatal Push here. Because we don't really have anything much going on outside of the Traveller right now. Uh, might as well just sack the Flesh Gorger here just to produce a bit of mana. You know, represent more removal spells. Oh wow, okay, perfect. So now we can get rid of the Fatal Push. Oh my god, okay. <laughs> well... Ha. Huh. So that's not going to do much help. I mean, I think we're still taking the Fatal Push here because... Maybe we're supposed to take Arcanist, but I feel like I just want to take, you know, work my way through those Fatal Pushes as quickly as I can, because Arcanist plus Fatal Push isn't really a big deal. We have Fatal Push to kill their Arcanists anyway, so, you know, I think Fatal Push is the thing we want to get rid of, even though they have three of them. Okay, sweet. Now we should just win. Okay, so we do Trap Finder, so we might as well just play and sack that to generate more mana, because that's mana positive, so means we're slightly less likely to brick. Not that we were likely to brick anyway, but now we can just go for Traveler. Opponent's tapped out. Uh, I'm going to prioritize taking a zombie here just because of Headless Rider. If we hit Headless Rider here, it would be nice to have the, the scab in play, and then we can sacrifice it to make a zombie token. Champion of the Parish is also great for the same reason, and it's also netting us a mana here as well, which is sick. And, okay, sweet. We've got the Headless Rider. Perfect. So I'm going to sacrifice the Champion of the Perish tier. Maybe should have gone for the Scab because there's a chance that Champion of the Perish could survive and that is one of our big win conditions. So probably should have sacked the Scab here, but I want to make sure that I don't play slowly because there is always a chance you're going to time out. So I think we should be good now though because it's very hard to brick with Headless Rider once you have this much mana. So now we have the Steelclad Spirit down. We can just play the Traveler again. Okay, sweet. Opponent just scoops up. So against Rakdos mid-range, I definitely want the Kolagans commands here. Thoughtseize honestly isn't that good because, you know, their deck is all pretty flat power level. So whilst Thoughtseizing can clear the way to combo, it doesn't really help us if they top deck well. 
So I think I might just go up and claim the first one instead. Cut the three thought seasons. Could keep one in, I guess. It's not the worst card ever. Just trying to think if there's anything better we could run. To be honest, I should probably run Feed the Swarm. Like, this deck is still a bit under the radar at the moment, but, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if people start running Curse of Shaken Faith in the sideboard of Rakdos, in which case it's probably a good idea to bring Feed the Swarm in. Especially because we saw Dreadhold Arcanist as well, and Claim the Firstborn isn't really a consistent answer to Arcanist on turn two unless we have Phyrexian Tower. So Feed the Swarm acts as both a tutorable out to Curse of Shaken Faith as well as uh, another removal spell that can kill Arcanist before they start attacking with it. So, but yeah, either way, I definitely like our chances in this matchup. We're running very similar decks. The only difference is that we just have a combo that can pop off out of nowhere. And even if we're not going infinite, Ominous Traveler is just very good for value, especially if we can get it down to zero mana. You know, even if we don't have Ashnod's Altar, having a zero mana Traveler in this matchup just enables you to constantly refill the board with stuff, which is super hard for Rakdos to deal with because I very much doubt they're going to be bringing in sweepers against us. So if we can establish a big board state, it's going to be very hard for them to beat. Okay, so we're going second here. I mean, obviously against the Thoughtseize deck, you don't really want to mulligan that often. So as long as our hand is somewhat reasonable, I think I'll be willing to keep it. Ha. Huh. I mean, this isn't great, but like I said, I don't really want to mulligan very much. Fable is very good at smoothing out draws anyway, and Traveler can be decent as just like a value card anyway, without even reducing it, so... Okay, nothing on turn one or two is great. I'm just going to run out the Traveler here, even though it could give them stuff to do with their mana if they're holding onto a Fatal Push or something. It basically replaces itself anyway, so we're still up on that exchange. Just going to go for the cheaper creature here because we have Diabolic Intent. You know, we could potentially go champion into Diabolic Intent next turn if we wanted to. Okay, Flame Blessed Bolt is interesting. So they've obviously brought that in as a way to kill Trap Finder that doesn't give us the Death Trigger, which is pretty smart. Let's see what they play here. Okay, so they're obviously holding up interaction. So I'm just going to run out Fable here because even if they do have a kill spell for the 2-2, we obviously get the looting and the reflection later as well. So my read on the opponent's hand is they've just got a bunch of interaction here, which kind of makes sense because the way you beat this combo is just holding up stuff like Fatal Push for the Traveler. But since the deck also has a decent plan B, they can't just sit doing nothing because we're just going to end up beating them down otherwise. Okay, yikes. They did do something, and that's a pretty good thing to be doing. So... That also means that we take life off any looting we do off Fable, so I don't want to loot two cards, but I think we can get away with looting away one land here. Do take an extra two damage, but, you know, we have chump blockers available, so... So I think uh, it's tough here because I do want to set up the combo. So I kind of want to get Ashnod's Altar in play here, but I also kind of want a chump blocker for the Shieldred. I also kind of want to set up Diabolic Intent to find the Trap Finder. Either way, I think I'm just going to get Ashnod's Altar into play here because that's probably the the combo piece that's hardest for them to interact with. And then I can just run out the Champion of the Perished here. And we can either Champ Block with it or wait until next turn, Diabolic Intent, get Trap Finder, and then start comboing off or try to combo off at least. And the other nice thing about that is we also get Reflection Flipping as well. Ah, okay, so they've got Inquisition. Probably going to take the Diabolic Intent here, I'd imagine. And then, I mean, Fable's still quite good, but we can't really afford to loot as much with Shieldred in play, which is an issue. I mean, opponent's in the tank here. I assume they have to take the Diabolic Intent, right? Because even if they kill the champion, we can still sack the Reflection. Yeah, yeah, okay. So they take the Diabolic Intent. Do we block here? This is kind of tough because we are definitely on a clock. If we're planning to play Fable, we're going to be taking damage off looting if we do loot as well, which is an issue. Okay, so no extra pressure from the opponent is very good to see. For us, from our point of view anyway. So I think here I'm just going to go Fable into Ominous Traveler. You know, if they have removal spells, it's whatever. But this at least gives us chump blockers in play. If we're not taking combat damage from the Shielded, I think we can afford to loot off the Fable. And Trap Finder is the card we're looking for now. If we hit Trap Finder, we basically just win on the spot unless the opponent's been holding on to Fatal Push. Since we don't really have good ways to loot the Traveler, you know, there's a good chance we might end up chump blocking with it. I like going for the Arch Fiend here because it's, you know, a standalone fine threat. Can potentially double block to kill the Shieldred and also scries when it dies as well. Or it, I, I guess it surveils instead, but it'll help us to dig towards Trap Finder anyway. 
Wow, okay. Opponents emptying their hand. I mean, I'm kind of surprised to see that. I guess they would probably want to kill the Traveler anyway, even if it's only a two-mana thing. And I guess they figured that we don't have the combo or we probably would have gone for it. But that's still pretty risky from the opponent because now if we do top deck a Trap Finder, we probably just win the game on the spot. Okay, so they thought this is the way the Arch, the arch Ghoul or whatever it's called. Huh. I mean, I think we just have to let this through here because we do want to be able to copy the 2-2. Two -two. Oh, wow. Okay, we did <laughs> we did just top deck the Trap Finder. I mean, that's pretty sick for us, obviously. So now we should just win. I don't see any world where we don't. We can copy the Trap Finder as well. So we get, two, we get an additional death trigger. We get to go up two mana because we're sacking two Trap Finders here. Already got the Traveler. So, yeah, we should just be good to win here now. So, yeah, opponent using that Flameless Bolt on the two mana Traveler might have been a mistake, but I guess... They were worried that we would just use that repeatedly to fill our board up anyway. Okay, so now there's basically zero chance that we ever brick. We're going into this with eight mana and presumably... Uh, I was going to say presumably another Traveler, but... Yeah, we should just win here. So we go Blade Stitch Scab, which is mana neutral. And if we find a Headless Rider, it actually becomes plus two mana. Going to go for Vampire Socialite here just because... You know, vampires are generally more useful than any of the other creature types outside zombies because of Dominating Vampire. Okay, speaking of, now we can go Dominating Vampire, steal one of their 1-1 one -one tokens and sack it to produce an extra 2 mana. So that's, you know, Dominating Vampire only costs 1 mana because of that. I'm uh, going to go for the Steel Cloud Spirit. You know, I think it's only really worth going for the 3 mana zombies once you already have the Headless Rider. If you can, it's pr usually better off just going for the 2 mana ones. Okay, sweet. Falkenrath Pit Fighter. So now we have enough vampires in play to use Dominating Vampire to steal the Shieldred, which is pretty sick. Okay, there's the Headless Rider. So now we're just, like, guaranteed to not brick. Going to sacrifice... Not, not going to sacrifice any of the vampires because, again, I would quite like to steal the Shieldred here. Not that it should matter. Let's be honest, we're probably better off stealing the 1-1 one -one because we are likely to win this turn, but just in case... You know, we can, we can suck the Reflection here. Yeah, okay, sweet. Okay, so we're going first here. And yeah, this looks good. Like, we do have sack outlets with nothing to sack, but, you know, we've got a lot of potential draws that can help smooth that out. And getting thought season one should help buy us a bit of time to find those sorts of things anyway. Okay, so opponent's obviously in the tank here about whether to mulligan or not. But yeah, overall, you know, there is definitely a fail rate with this sort of hand, but any, any trap finder off the top is nuts. You know, even Traveller as a way to sack the Diabolic Intent to find Trap Finder is good. You know, Fable is obviously great as well, so... I think I think this is a decent enough hand. Ha, huh, okay. So we're definitely not taking Croxa. I think I like going Inquisition because we have Fatal Push as a way to answer Rahilda, and they could just take our Diabolic Intent otherwise. Now, the risk of doing this is if they do draw a uh, discard spell before they play the Rahilda, that could be an issue because then they could take our Fatal Push, but... I still think it's the better option because I like, you know, Diabolic Intent and Ashnod's Altar are both very important here. Wow, they did draw the discard spell. Yikes. Okay, so that's that's an issue because now we don't have a way to kill Rahilda. I mean, thankfully, it's not going to flip tonight because we can play the Ashnod's Altar, but not ideal. Like, obviously, we would have preferred them not to find a discard spell before they play the Rahilda, but... I still think my play was probably right because defending Ashnod's Altar and Diabolic Intent from... Um, from Inquisition seems really important. Obviously, like, claim the Firstborn will be nuts off the top here because we could steal the Rahilda attack, get one of their cards, and then sack it. Uh, but to be honest, any creature off the top would be good here, just as a way to find Trap Finder. Okay, Season Pyro, that's not great for us because they can pitch Croxa and, you know, hopefully draw into more... Well, they, they would hope to draw more interaction. Yikes. Okay, so this is kind of rough here. I mean, Sokanzan helps us here because we can potentially go channel the Sokanzan, sack to find Trap Finder, and then maybe go off next turn, but I feel like we might be forced to block the Rahilda with Sokanzan tokens. To be honest, I think 
The line to win here with this hand is probably hope that they tap out. You know, hopefully they find something good off Rahilda or they have like a three or four mana play that they just tap out for. Because we can potentially, if we get lucky, we can go Sokanzan, Diabolic Intent for Trap Finder, and then combo off. Wow, they're tapping out for Fable. I really hope they they just play a tap land here. Okay, perfect. So we actually have a chance to win now. So the reason I didn't want to chump there is because it gives us a much better chance of winning this turn. So, oh, oh, hold on, hold on. I want to make sure that we keep red mana open here. So we're going to tap the Phyrexian Tower, tap the Black Pathway, and search for Trap Finder. And the reason for that is that if Trap Finder finds another Trap Finder, we really want to be able to cast it. So in a perfect world, we go Trap Finder into Trap Finder into Traveler. That would be ideal because then we go plus on mana twice and we still find the Traveler. Okay, so we need to not brick here, basically. If we find another Trap Finder, we probably lose here. If we hit Traveler, we probably win. Okay, perfect, perfect. So now we can run out the Traveler. And now we have, you know, not only do we have two mana, but we, we, have, we essentially have six mana because we can sacrifice the 1-1 one, one as well. Uh, and, okay, Dominating Vampire is nice here because we can... Uh, take control of the Rahilda here because we already have another zombie, in pl uh, another vampire in play. Actually, wait. Hmm. I mean, thinking about it, we probably should have taken the two-two token because I think we're actually pretty likely to be able to win this turn. But I don't think it should make too much of a difference. It basically just means that we'd need to find another dominating vampire later. Uh, the reason I've not played the den out here is because of the shipwreck sifters. You know, we could potentially draw into an untapped land, which would then give us extra mana here. Okay, didn't. I might as well pitch it anyway. I, I, I think we're, we're pretty likely to win, so I probably should have taken... Okay, we'll take the, the second Dominating Vampire now, but yeah. I probably should have taken the 2-2 instead of the Rahilda there, just because that, you know, then the way is clear. We, 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 we wouldn't need an extra Dominating Vampire later to clear the way. Okay, Headless Rider, perfect. I think we, sh we should just be good to win now then, especially with the Champion of the Perished already in play. I mean, ideally, we'd like to keep this Champion of the Perished around so that we can just grow it and then win with a Dominating Vampire. And I think that's what we'll try and do now. So basically, now we're in a position where we, we're definitely going to be able to buff this Champion of the Perished all the way up to an 18-18, especially because we've got the Headless Rider here. So all we need now is just a Dominating Vampire. We don't need any other Vampires in play because as long as Dominating Vampire is, you know, Say we cast Dominating Vampire with no other Vampires in play. We still have one Vampire because Dominating Vampire itself is a Vampire. And Champion of the Perished is only a one drop. So as long as we find another Dominating Vampire, we're guaranteed to give this Champion of the Perished um, haste. Which then allows us to win if we can get its power up to 18. And with two Headless Riders, every zombie we play produces two more zombies. Which then buffs the Champion of the Perished even more. So... As long as we can find another um, Dominating Vampire here, we should just be good to win. Yeah, okay. Opponent scoops it up. So, Rakdos midrange. I think we'll just sideboard like we did before. Just cut the Thought Seizes for extra interaction. Feed the Swarm, just in case they're running Curse of Shaken Faith. You know, we want to have an answer to it. And Kolagun's Command is just good value in this matchup, especially against discard spells or Fatal Push. You know, I've I imagine the opponent is going to try and get the zero mana Traveler with Fatal Push if they can. So being able to, you know, 2 for 1 the opponent and get back the Traveler from the graveyard is really sick. So I like Kulligan's Command a lot in this matchup. And then, you know, Claim the Firstborn is very nice, especially if they're running stuff like Rahilda as just early interaction. Or like, it's also great against the 2-2 from Fable of the Mirror Breaker because we can, you know... Claim the 2-2, attack, get a treasure, so it essentially pays for itself. You know, the claim pays for itself as well. So claim seems pretty good here, and then... Um, yeah, Feed the Swarm, like I said. Curse of Shaken Faith is a card I expect to start seeing play in Rakdos sideboard, so I want to be prepared for that. And it's also just another removal spell for their early threats as well, which is especially important on the draw here. Okay, no discard spell on turn one is great to see. But yeah, this hand overall is pretty good. You know, as long as the Ashnaz altar, we can, as long as we can get the Ashnaz altar into play, then we should be good because we can use the claim the first bond. So we are in a tough position here. I really don't want it to give Rahil the double strike here. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna claim an attack, even though they get the creature back. 
I think it's better than letting it flip tonight and letting them get in for two cards every single turn. And then next turn we can always just K command to kill the Rahilda anyway. Okay, they got D Diabolic Intent, which is kind of scary. They choose to just go for Fable, sure. So, huh, we've got a lot of options here. We could just go K command killing the Rahilda. We could K command killing the 2 2. We could claim the first bond, the 2 2 attack, play the altar and sack it, which seems like the best play proactively, but that does then give them another t attack and card off the Rahilda, which is a bit concerning. I think I I think that the best play to me seems claim the 2 2 attack and use altar to sack it. If we had something to use with the 2 mana, then I think this would be by far and away the best play, but. This deals with one of their problematic threats and gets one of ours in play. Whereas if we just go K command, kill the Rahilda, they still get to get ahead on mana with the 2-2 two -two token. But, I mean, if they do get lucky with Rahilda hits, I could also regret that decision maybe. And I guess they already have Diabolic Intent, so they could just search for whatever they want anyway. So maybe I was supposed to kill the Rahilda there. I think it's pretty close though. Yeah, if they had Diabolic Intent here, yeah, maybe I should have killed the Rahilda then, because we knew they had access to that. What do they find here, though? Maybe they go for a Thought Seize or a way to kill the Ashnod's Altar, maybe? Either way, we're just going to go for Fable here. I want to hold on to the K command to kill the Reflection. That was another reason why I quite like going for the Altar instead of the K, com K command last turn, because if we go for K command... Oh, okay, so they did probably search for the Abrade. So now we don't have the altar anymore, which is a bit of an issue. But yeah, the other downside of going for K Command instead of the claim into altar play is that it also doesn't give us any way to kill the Reflection, which is definitely a big problem because I, I think this game is going to go on, you know, it, it seems like it's quite a grindy matchup or like a qu quite a grindy game at the moment. And so letting Reflection stick around is just going to give the opponent such a big advantage. Okay, and they fatal push the 2-2. I guess they tried to do that before, you know, because we could be running Deadly Dispute in theory. I don't actually think we really want to cycle any of these cards away. I think I kind of, I, I'm forced to K command here because we can't let them untap with Reflection plus Season Pyromancer. Or we, we just don't want to let them activate the Reflection regardless. Okay, they pitch Rahilda, which is kind of scary. It must mean they have another really good card in hand. Okay, the Inquisition, so we're probably losing... Oh, wow, they let us... Oh, okay, I was going to say, probably losing Diabolic Intent, but now they completely empty our hands, so that's pretty rough. Yeah, thinking about... I think the turning point in this game was probably the uh, claim the firstborn turn, but I still feel on balance that that was probably the right play. Just to make whether to play this land here or not, because we can potentially discard the land instead of Gigantha... If they plus, I'm like 99% sure that 99 sure they're going to minus here, but I don't think there's much of a risk of holding onto this land, because if we draw another non-land, then we wouldn't have been able to cast it anyway unless it's a one-drop. And if we draw another land, it doesn't really matter, I don't think. Either way, I think I'm just going to slam Gigantha here. If they choose to minus the Lily to kill the Gigantha, then, you know, that deals with Liliana permanently. If they plus, we lose the Fable, but then they need to find another way to kill Gigantha. Okay, so they do... I mean, they did get a lot of value off the Liliana, but at least they're not upticking it every turn. Wow, and they have an Inquisition as well. That's pretty rough. And another Season Pyromancer. Okay. I mean... I'll have to go back and rewatch this game, but I feel like we might be losing this because they top-decked quite well, but... It's hard to say. I feel like there could have also been somewhere I made a mistake. I still feel like that claim the Firstborn turn was pretty pivotal. I mean, we can survive here by playing Ominous Traveller, but now that they've killed the the Ashnod's Altar, I don't really think we have many good ways to actually win the game from this point. If we still had Altar, we could just win off with just drawing Trap Finder off the top, which is the real strength of this deck. You only really need Altar plus Trap Finder in order to win. But now that they've killed the Altar... Yeah, thinking back on it, since we knew they had Diabolic Intent... I probably should have just gone for K Command instead of Claim the Firstborn. I mean, it'd be interesting to see how that version of the game would have played out, but I feel like them abrading the Ashnod's Altar, which I assume they searched off the um, 
Diabolic Intent was the thing that caused us to lose this game. I mean, I still don't know if we would have won because we didn't draw the Trap Finder, but at least that would have given us an out, if that makes sense. Either way, going into game three, I feel like... You know, I feel like the opponent managed to get so ahead that game because they drew quite well. You know, had they not stripped all the cards from our hand when they went for Inquisition plus Liliana, we would have had multiple Fables going, or we could have had Diabolic Intent to search for another combo piece. So, yeah, interesting game for sure. Either way, going into game three, this hand looks sick to me. You know, we can go Trap Finder on turn one. We have Double Altar, so we're quite Thought Seize proof. Um... And if they don't have a way to exile the Trap Finder, I think we're just guaranteed to win on turn four if we hit our fourth land on curve. I mean, we don't even need our fourth land, really. I mean, they could Inquisition away the Ashnod's Altar and then Thought Seize the other one or something. Wow, okay, they take claim the Firstborn. Interesting. So that probably tells me they don't have another discard spell, or I feel like they probably would have just taken the both of the Altars here. But yeah, either way, I think, you know, I feel pretty good about this spot. So this is an interesting spot because we could try and go off here, but I think the fail rate of, you know, f four mana is a bit iffy. And I feel like since we have a backup altar, the opponent would need a very specific sequence of cards for us to not just win next turn. Because, you know, I guess they could have two fatal pushes, right? They could just, you know, push one of the travelers that we get, push the other one as well, but... Oh, okay, they just tap out. Yeah, I was going to say, they would need to get quite lucky. Again, maybe it was correct to go off the turn before just to shut that off, but if we brick and then they do kill the traveler or they, like, thought seize the traveler, then we're in real trouble, whereas here we should just be good to win. So I'll play the extra trap finder here just to go mana positive again. And now, yeah, sweet. we've got two travellers, so I don't think there's any possible way we can brick here. Go for the one-mana creatures first. And then, generally early on, you want to prioritise Headless Rider if you think it can survive. Perfect. Okay, I mean, Dominating Vampire is also quite nice, but Headless Rider is much more beneficial as you combo off a bit further, basically. 